This is going to be a more serious episode of Out of the Groove, I feel like. NASCAR just revealed the rules package for next season, and we got to talk a little bit more about Alex Bowman versus Bubba Wallace, the drama from this past weekend that's carried over into the week. we got to talk about all of that and more. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Yes, I got a Chase Elliott hat. If you follow me on Twitter, you know the story behind that. But before I get too far into today's episode, I want to thank today's sponsor, Forney. I'm going to swap my hat out for just a minute here. Forney Industries. Forney is one of America's longest-running family-owned tool, equipment, and accessory product companies, and they offer nearly 5,000 different metalworking products. Welding equipment, personal protective equipment, shop tools, all that great stuff they have it, and more. Forney Industries is your one-stop shop for all your automotive, hardware, industrial, do-it-yourself needs. And actually, Forney has signed on as a longtime partner of Out of the Groove, so for the next several weeks, basically through the rest of these playoffs, every single week we'll be doing a giveaway on Twitter, giving away some awesome Forney products, swag, like this awesome hat I think you can win this week. I'll put the link down in the description, so get over there, do what you gotta do to enter and have a chance to win these awesome prizes. Big thank you to Forney Industries for being a long-term partner now of Out of the Groove. This is a cool hat, but I made a promise on Twitter that I'd wear the Chase Elliott hat for a week, so yeah, it's going back on the head. For those of you follow me on Twitter. I said after he wrecked at the Roval when he went head onto the wall, I tweeted that if he somehow came back to win, which I thought he might, which is why I thought it was reasonable, uh, if he came back to win, I told you guys I'd buy a Chase Elliott hat and wear it for a week to out of the groove. So uh, for the next few episodes, I guess you're probably going to see this on my head. So sorry if you're a Chase Elliott hater. I'm not a bandwagoner, guys. I just I just because he won the Roval, I just want to show some support. It was an impressive comeback. What am I, what am I supposed to say? Kind of a lighthearted start to this episode, but we do have some serious things to talk about. We're going to talk about Alex Bowman and Bubba Wallace, their drama you know, on pit road uh, and on the track from some Sunday's race. Uh, but before that, let's talk about the news from yesterday. Breaking news, NASCAR revealed the rules package for 2020. We got one more year until the Gen 7, or as NASCAR now says they're calling it, the next gen car is going to be released. So 2020, kind of still that awkward gap year uh, until we get to 2021. We're going to have an all new car, all new everything pretty much. Uh, but 2020, let's talk about the changes and there are not that many of them. Just like 2019 here, we're going to see 550 horsepower next year at all tracks, one and a half miles long and longer. Uh, and then at all the shorter racetracks, mile or less, we're going to see 750 horsepower. Still the huge rear spoiler, pretty much in that sense, pretty much the same as what we have this year. Not a lot of differences there. There's a couple new notable restrictions that NASCAR is putting on the team, seemingly in an attempt, again, to cut costs uh, and even the playing field, sort of. Firstly, NASCAR is limiting the number of road crew positions a team can have from 12 now down to 10 next year, so let's cut out two people there. That does not include the pit crew, though, so I know, like, last week there were rumors that the Xfinity or Truck Series might be doing away with live pit stops in some of the coming years. This has nothing to do with that, and no, they're not limiting pit crew sizes any further next year, so don't worry about that one. The other big notable thing, though, is that NASCAR is going to be limiting the total number of hours each team can spend in the wind tunnel. The big teams like Joe Gibbs Racing, Hendrick Penske, those types of people spend hours each week in the wind tunnel, fine-tuning their stuff so that they have the fastest race cars each week. NASCAR is now putting a hard cap on the number of hours. It's going to be 150 hours. That's how many hours you're allowed to spend in the wind tunnel next year. It's interesting that they put an actual cap on this. This is another one, an attempt to cut costs, keep teams from overspending on testing, and also evens the playing field, because some of those smaller teams cannot afford to put their cars in the wind tunnel every week, hour after hour, uh, so this sort of evens the playing field there, perhaps. Uh, but those are a couple of the most notable restrictions. There's a few other small details, but I'll let you guys read the articles and go into that uh, on your own time, because it's too much to get into here, and it's not really super, it's not going to affect the racing product too much. The body, the aero package, really no changes next year, so that's really what we're going to care about the most, I think, and uh, it's going to look the same in 2020 as it has so far in 2019. Now this is of course once again brought up the debate do people like the air package? I don't want to talk about that too much in this episode. I just exhausted myself with that conversation, you know, months ago. Uh, but just kind of one final thought here. In 2021, when the Gen 7 car, or the next Gen car is introduced, it looks like NASCAR is going to go with a spec chassis, which means every single team is going to be issued the exact same type of chassis. Another way to cut costs so teams aren't out there making them themselves, working on themselves, but it's also going to cut jobs. There's a lot of downsizing involved in NASCAR right now, and there has been for the last couple of years. Started at NASCAR Corporate, and I mentioned this last week, they cut 10% of their workforce just at the beginning of this year. Race teams and drivers have seen pay cuts. They've seen downsizing. NASCAR has limited the number of people who can go over the wall in a pit crew this year. I think it was, what, six? This year, I think it's five, or maybe it was seven, six. I don't remember, but they decreased it by one this year. So there's a lot of downsizing. I see a lot of people, once again, uh, disappointed by this, and rightfully so. There's a lot of people who are likely going to be losing their jobs uh, in the next year or so because of these cutbacks. And I just want to address this a little bit. It sucks. It really does. Uh, but I don't like a lot of the negativity I've seen about it. A lot of people continue to point to this as showing 
showing how NASCAR is done for. NASCAR can't come back from this. NASCAR definitely can come back from this. Uh, a lot of people are once again lamenting over the many changes as the reasons. The, the playoffs, the aero package, the car of tomorrow, all these types of things. Stage racing. I've seen every single type of complaint you can possibly see in the last couple days uh, on social media. And I want to kind of, this is my take on that. And everyone wants to point to all these types of things as why NASCAR has declined. And I think a lot of them have played a factor. I think Brian France's leadership definitely rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I think some of the changes, such as implementing the chase or the playoffs, such as changing the race cars so much, the playoff formats, the stage race, everything. I think some of that did turn away a few fans. But in my personal opinion, I think that even if NASCAR really didn't change any of that stuff, if we never had the playoffs, if they only, you know, if we moved away from the Gen 4 to what we did now, if that was the only change we made, is moving from the Gen 4 to kind of something we have now, or just moving away from the Gen 4 entirely, if that was the only change that happened, Personally, I still think NASCAR would have seen a bit of a decline. I just think times have changed in such a way where watching cars go in circles for four hours is not appealing to the mass public anymore. I think we can debate about the aero package. I think we can debate about the rules, but I think what it really comes down to is star power. And NASCAR does not have much star power right now. You look at what's driven the NBA to the top of America. I mean, it's not quite where football is, but it's getting there. Uh, it's star power. They have huge names competing. You look at golf. When Tiger Woods is playing well in a tournament, TV ratings are whoa. Everything about this social media driven, televised world, it's about star power. It's about who do you have participating. And right now NASCAR doesn't have anyone. And I personally think that even if they never made a change, if we'd never seen stage racing, never seen the playoffs, I still think this decline, it may not have gotten quite as low as it is now, but I think this decline was inevitable because NASCAR peaked in the 90s with Jeff Gordon versus Dale Earnhardt. You had the clashing lifestyles, the young hotshot kid versus the old school rough guy. Uh, you had two clashing views there, two clashing groups of people. It was a great rivalry that drove the sport into ratings that were not thought possible, but obviously that was never going to last. Jeff Gordon had to retire at some point. Dale Earnhardt Sr. obviously passed away tragically, but even he was gonna have to retire at some point. That was not gonna last, and you look ever since then, the names that people grew up with kind of from those 90s, like Dale Earnhardt, like Dale Earnhardt Jr., like Tony Stewart, uh, they have left. And I think that's why NASCAR fans put so much pressure on a lot of the big names we have now, or the modestly sized names we have now. I think there's a reason we put so much pressure on Chase Elliott. There's a reason we put so much pressure on on Haley Deegan, who we don't even know if she's ever going to make it to the Cup Series. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the package is. It doesn't matter what the rules are. If we have recognizable, relatable, on, on a national scale, names and faces competing, the sport's going to do just fine. It can build itself, dig itself out of this hole a little bit. So that's why we put so much pressure on these drivers. And it's unfair to them because they didn't sign up to have all this extra pressure heaped on them. It's just the truth of it right now. That's why we put so much pressure on Danica Patrick. Big superstar from IndyCar came over. We wanted her to be great. She was going to help vault NASCAR, help save them from that little decline. And then she wasn't able to. We put all this pressure on Chase Elliott and he's starting to live up to it. And I think it's got a lot of fans excited. And we put a lot of pressure on some of these other young drivers who we still, it's just so hard to put that much pressure on because we really don't know if they're ever going to evolve into the superstars we need them to be. I would say this year the racing has been more entertaining than in years past, specifically on the mile and a half, which is what this package aimed to fix. Mile and a half this year in a lot of ways have been outstanding, some of the best races of the year. I tweeted the other day, I think Charlotte might be the best track in NASCAR again. I know only you know two of the races this year are on the mile and a half part of the track, but the all-star race was amazing, the 600 was really good, and now the Roval. Uh, the mile and a half, man, Kansas was amazing this year, Kentucky was amazing this year, Texas was better than it's been since the repave. Sure, Richmond's not as good, Dover's not not as good. I would argue Watkins Glen's not quite as good. But other than that, I think the Sarah package has been a success, but you guys know my opinion on that. Obviously, you guys can have your opinion. I'm not here to force my opinion onto you. I'm just here to share it, and you guys can take with it and react to it however you will. I've just seen a lot of people overreacting, I feel like, the last day or two, and it is what it is. People are entitled to their opinions. I just wish more people were able to step back and at least try to see things from a few different angles. You know, NASCAR can't bend to the will of every single individual fan. No, they have to look at a large group and kind of try to gather a consensus when they make these decisions. So not everyone's going to be happy with every decision they make, but uh, it is what it is. Let's, let's move on from that. Let's move on to something a little more spicy. And this is also kind of serious because I've seen a lot of people on social media just going off on this in whichever direction they opt to take it. Uh, anyway, so at the end of the Robo race, you guys remember this, I showed this clip uh, in my review episode a couple days ago. Uh, Bubba Wallace was upset with Alex Bowman because Bowman wrecked Bubba on purpose during the race. And Bubba came up to Bowman while Bowman was seated outside of his car getting medical attention, uh, said a couple words to him, and then splashed his water or Gatorade, whatever it was, splashed it in his face, and then turned and walked off. And I said in, the, in my video the other day that I didn't think it was a very good look for Bubba Wallace, and it's not. Anytime there's a guy literally, you know, suffering there on the ground with medical attention, and Jeff Gordon, I don't know why Jeff Gordon was there, but medical people around him helping cool him down, and then you go up to him then and pick a fight, and then just splash water and walk away, you don't even let him retaliate, 
It's not a good look for you. It's not a good look to punch someone when they're sitting down. And a lot of fans kind of agreed with that, and I think saw it the same way. Uh, I don't like, have any real disrespect for Bubba Walls. I love that at least he's showing that passion. That's something that NASCAR desperately needs, is passion from its competitors like that. I just thought there might have been a better way to show it in that instance. I didn't think that was just, I just didn't think it was a good look. And it's not, it was not a good look. But I've seen a bunch of debate from fans. I even saw an article from Forbes today uh, that talked about how NASCAR has become too soft. I don't think anyone's, or very few people at least, are actually that angry at Bubba Wallace for doing that. I don't think, you know, when Clint Boyer went up to Ryan Newman and punched Newman while Newman was defenseless still in his car, a lot of people gave B uh, Boyer some flack for that, but nobody took it that seriously. I think that's the same situation here between Bubba and Alex Bowman. No one's taking it that seriously. It's just, you know, from the outside looking at not a great look for Bubba Wallace. But this argument that NASCAR has become too soft, it's, it's a fair discussion to have because NASCAR, I've kind of argue the day it was put on the map was back in the late 70s when the Daytona 500 finally made it to national TV and it ended with a fist fight. Uh, that kind of put NASCAR on the map, a fist fight. And now we don't really see fist fights hardly ever. We sometimes see little shoves, some little grabs, you know. Sometimes you get like a weird cage wrestling match like we saw in the truck series a couple years ago, whatever that was. What this really comes down to is two different perspectives, two different opinions on this one. There's some people out there that really think you gotta punch people or else they're not gonna respect you. There's other people that would rather use their words than violence. And you know, it's just a clashing ideas here. That's really all this is. I think the people who would rather use words than violence are thinking that what Bubba Wallace did was a little over the edge. Edge, whereas other people that want more punching think that what Bubba Wallace did wasn't enough. They wish he'd like tackled Alex Bowman or something. I don't know. It's just opinion on that one. I'm not a violent person. I usually don't jump into physical altercations when, you know, as like my first choice for things like that. But that being said, could NASCAR benefit from more fist fights? Yeah. Yeah, freaking everything could benefit from more fist fights. That's 100% true. Americans love violence. The world loves violence. People like to see violence on TV. So yes, if NASCAR drivers want to punch each other some more, let them. If I think what you're doing is still kind of wrong, like when Clint Boyer tried punching Ryan Newman and I thought he was kind of in the wrong for that, I'll still say you're in the wrong, but that doesn't mean I don't want you to keep punching. Keep punching. Gives us stuff to watch. Gives us stuff to talk about and debate. That's what this really comes down to. Any physical altercation is good, in my opinion. I don't care if it's just splashing water in his face. You know, it's good because it allows us to debate whether or not it was fair or not. It's getting NASCAR more attention. It's entertainment. You clicked on this video because you wanted to hear my opinion on the Alex Bowman Bubble Walls thing. You know, that's what I mean. It's creating engagement. It's creating discussion. And that's what NASCAR needs. It needs people to talk about its sport in any capacity. Good, bad, off the track, on the track. It just, just needs conversation. That's what it really needs. So uh, ultimately, again, I thought Bubba Wall splashing the water on Alex Bowman. And then afterwards, his quote was that uh, Bowman was playing the sick card. thought that was a little, I don't know, a little below the belt, in my opinion. But at the end of the day, he did just splash some water on him. Some of these fans think that he should have punched Alex Bowman. No, don't punch a guy when he's getting medical attention sitting on the ground. Wait, you know, 20 minutes, wait an hour, wait for him to at least be standing up. But hey, if he had punched Alex Bowman, once again, we could just have this debate and just talk about it. That's really what it comes down to. I like talking about uh, drama on and off the track, and I think most fans do too. So we need more people like Bubba Wallace to sh wear their heart on their sleeve and show people literally how they feel. Don't just tell us how you feel. Show us how you feel. When Daniel Suarez, Michael McDowell got in a fighter this year, I already referenced Newman and Boyer. You know, those are big personalities in the sport. Now Bubba here, another big personality in the sport. You like to see it. You want to see the big personalities you know, on the brightest, biggest stage here. You want to see them on full display as much as possible. I know NASCAR's reaction to this, they called it a uh, not very classy move from uh, Bubba Walls. I don't anticipate any penalties or anything like that though. Just you know, there you go, that's, that's all it was. So that's all I really wanted to talk about in this video. Hey there, sorry to interrupt myself here really quick. Uh, so I was in the middle of editing the episode that you guys are watching right now and then more news broke. So I wanted to talk about that really quick. Tyler Reddick will be driving the eight car next year for Richard Childress Racing. Breaking news, but I didn't want to dedicate a whole episode to this. I figured I'd just toss this in right here so you guys are aware of it. Uh, we already kind of knew this was going to happen when Daniel Hemrick was revealed to be leaving last week. So I uh, already kind of knew Tyler Reddick was going to go to the eight car, but it is confirmed now. So just wanted to mention that so you guys weren't going to be commenting, hey, what about Tyler? Tyler Reddick, you didn't talk about Tyler Reddick in this video. I filmed that video you guys are watching earlier this morning, so hate it when news breaks in the middle of editing, because then I feel like I have to go back and refilm everything. But anyway, back to the episode. I know, kind of a weird episode, but I kept the Chase Elliott hat on, so y'all are hopefully happy. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. Thanks again to Forney Industries for sponsoring this episode. Remember to follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Remember to click that link down below so you enter the Forney giveaway opportunity on Twitter. And of course, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison, at you as the stars, Cameron James, John Coleman, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennis and Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Koulopoulos, Pepe Lucius, Jeremy Conkley, Emilio Garcia, Joey DiMaccino, Sky Racing Forms, Bryce Schumacher, Colton Austin, Scott McNew, Bradley Pelletier, and the rest of these incredible Patreon supporters. I couldn't do the show without the support I get from you guys every single week. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for being 
freaking amazing. Should have released one more video up this week. Uh, we might have some silly season news to talk about. Ross Chastain's name's been coming up a little bit more recently. We might talk about that in a couple of days. Uh, but yeah, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thanks for watching this episode. Thank you for being awesome. Thanks for continuing to talk about NASCAR. It's really awesome. We're also really close to 100,000 subscribers here. We just hit 97,000. We're in that final home stretch. It's a grind, but we're trying to scrape our way up in there. 100,000 subscribers. I can't thank you guys enough once we get there. Hopefully it's soon. I hope we get there before Christmas. That would be the best Christmas gift. I just come downstairs, open it up. Wow, 100,000 subscribers under the tree. That's amazing. Let's see if we can make it happen. Thank you all for your support. I'll see you all again very, very soon.